So we have a long tradition and a lot of experience in this, uh, with this technology, and it really has been updated and upgraded, and a lot of new features were, were coming through it. So in everyday clinical practice, we can really use the AXL Wave now for a lot of uh, examination, screening for all kinds of comorbidities. If we have a patient, we have to work up for cataract refractive surgery or a corneal patient uh, in a cornea clinic or a keratoconus uh, clinic. All these uh, things uh, are here, comorbidities, early ectasia, refractive display for corneal uh, refractive surgery, the Belin ABCD staging and progression for the uh, pre and post uh, cross-linking patients, but also anatomy of the anterior chamber. If you want to put in a faking IOL, if you want to do IOL calculation, all the modern formulas, including the Barrett and other things, and also uh, things for a uh, post-LASIK patient, everything is included here. And last but not least, especially now added with the uh, wavefront measurement, you get a whole and total uh, wavefront, and you can separate between the corneal and the internal wavefront and the entire wavefront, and also give the patient uh, in display where you can show him what's wrong or what, what is the problem, so he better understands when you have to do some treatment pre or post operative. So the addition to the AXL, you can see here the new features. Objective refraction also is in there, the visual performance, and then uh, also the IOL calculation for every kind of corneal shape. So if you have a full sequence overview here in a normal, uh, or in a fake eye, let's put it this way, yeah, you have here the total visual performance, which is uh, the wavefront of the entire optical system. You have the iris image in the scotopic and mesopic version, the retro illumination, which is quite interesting. We will talk about that later also. And the, the photopic uh, iris uh, image. Then we have the refraction, so you see it here, the wavefront, the abrometry, axial length, biometry, everything is in here, tomography. Then we have, for example, one would like to, to ask what is, what's going on, why we have uh, such a, a funny uh, total um, wavefront here. And if you look at it, you differentiate between the corneal uh, uh, wavefront, abrometry of the entire cornea, including the back, actually. Uh, internal, this would be the lens or the capsular bag with an intraocular lens uh, placed in it. And then the sum of it, the abrometry of the entire eye. And uh, you can look at the cornea, you can look at the erythral elimination, and here the hartmann schuck arrays are listed here, refraction aberrations. All this is, can be seen in one, one picture. And here, for example, beginning cataract or presbyopia uh, can be the reason that this is a lens-related uh, pathology in a case like this. So for everyday praxis, we have this visualization of uh, the wavefront uh, as we just seen it. The ritual illumination photo is not only interesting for cataracts. I mean, it tells us an advantage. For example, if uh, there are some insurance issues, you can uh, uh, identify uh, the cataract and you can uh, document it. And also, if you have the ritual illumination photo, you can easily look at the optics of a lens. For example, the uh, uh, the toric lens, and you can overlay that with the tomography, and you can see, okay, is it on axis, is it not on axis, how much is this decentered? And I will show you an example later uh, on this. So if we have, for example, here a clinical case, oh, go on, uh, a patient came to me who had a, a um, uh, Artelisa tree toric uh, implanted, it was a high myopic patient with three diopter, and uh, visual acuity was not satisfactory, and he had residual refraction, if you just look at the overview, there's nothing really so much special. You see that there was a, a regular astigmatism, so it's not an irregular thing. If you look at the other parameters here, you see that he uh, had a, a myopic refraction. If you look at the uh, wavefront, you see here the cornea, which, of course, with 3 diopter for astigmatism, uh, it looks like this. And the internal must look like this because you have a, a toric lens in there, so it's also not sharp. But the total image is not too bad because we have more or less uh, corrected uh, two-thirds uh, of the uh, uh, astigmatism. So that image is, is OK. But if you look here at the retroillumination, you can exactly see that this lens uh, is not where it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be at 100 degrees, and it's at 90 degrees, 10 degrees uh, uh, of uh, rotation here. So this uh, causes the loss of visual acuity here and the, and the refraction. You can use, for example, here the Bördal-Harden calculator under uh, astigmatismusfix.com 
to calculate in what direction do, you, do I have to shift the lens in order to correct that. And it's not always the primary uh, uh, axis where you have to put it. So this is quite easy to, to calculate and then you can do what you want. However, now with the uh, uh, new ISA wave, you also have that even implemented with the so-called Barrett RX formula. So what you do, you put in your uh, refraction, the outcome that you had. You put in, of course, the type of lens which was implanted and so on, all these details. And uh, then you have to say what kind of calculation methods. Do I have, for example, here a post-LASIK RK patient or what? Or do I have a problem with the uh, placement or the centration of the intraocular lens, which is called here error in the predicted ELP. And then they will calculate for you automatically three different uh, possibilities that you have. You can rotate the toric IOL, for example, and it will tell you the residual uh, astigmatism here, or they give you the opportunity, what if I just add a toric piggyback, would that be an option? Or if I exchange the IOL, what type of IOL do I have to place in? So all these things are automatically calculated for you and help you to uh, get this problem done, so to say. Then I would like to focus on the keratograph 5M. Uh, I really like this very much uh, to, to give an objective uh, uh, means of quantifying the surface uh, situation, the, the tear film situation. And, uh, you have, you have uh, uh, several different modes. You can, can measure the TF or R scan, the MIBO scan, imaging uh, um, with the blue light of fluorescence uh, on the eye, and, uh, and the TF scan here, which means when you go into that, um, that you also need a different magnification because one time you look at the entire eye, you want to give a redness scare, then you look on the cornea, and then you even go further uh, uh, if you look at the uh, content of the of the tear film and the inf interferometry, uh, looking if the lipid uh, layer is, is correct, then you even focus cost more. So this is all implemented in the um, keratograph. So this is all the things you can do. You can look at uh, the amount of uh, tears you have, at the quality of the tears, the so mybography, and all these things are here uh, listed. And I will show you uh, what kind of uh, things you can do, especially if you if you look at the kind of elaborative workout you have to do uh, with a with patient uh, and all the different type of uh, tests you have to do to get a good diagnostic screening of a, of a dry eye patient. All this can be done with uh, one machine giving you all the information that you need to, to find your way about um, what kind of surface problem uh, we have and of course what treatment. And then you get a, this kind of nine color or nine uh, uh, photo uh, image here where they really display exactly what kind of pathology is there. They give you a staging from green, everything is okay, to red, everything is, is wrong. Uh, and also the intermediate stages here. Talking about the tear film, the lead margin, the lid function, even blink reflex, conjunctiva, cornea, redness, all this kind of stuff is listed here, including a questionnaire. So you really can do a pro uh, comprehensive uh, workup with our uh, patient here. And the uh, MIBO scan, uh, you get beautiful pictures. You really get, a, get an idea uh, uh, if you have a mybomium uh, gland disease uh, in these patients and to what extent. I also like very much the uh, breakup time, the non-invasive keratographic breakup time. It really gives you uh, 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 a map, so to say, where you have an issue. Yeah, uh, it's quite nice uh, to see that, and also give, gives you the time uh, how long it takes to uh, solve the tear film, and, uh, and then you can show that actually to the patients, and you have a collective view of it and draw some conclusions from it. And you get a printout you can give to the patient, which summarizes and which has some explanation to it. And very simple, uh, even uh, a doctor can understand that <laughs> if you are in the green area or in the, in the red area. So quite a handy thing to work with. Let's see a, a simple, simple example. Patient comes to me, gets a femtofaco, get a trifocal lens, first week very happy, uncorrected visual acuity 0.8, 1.0. Then this lady comes back after four weeks and visual acuity drops down to 0.4. Yeah, if you look slit lamp, OCT, everything is fine. So you start thinking, what's going wrong? What, what, what did I do wrong? If you look at the uh, uh, normal uh, topography, everything is fine. But if you then do the keratograph, you see, first of all, the left eye 
is a borderline in terms of uh, quantity of uh, tears. The, the uh, lipid phase is not optimal. You can see that, but on both eyes. And then you see a clear difference here in terms of the breakup time on the left eye, which really then explains uh, the problem. And what you do is you just do dry eye treatment, and then the patient was better. A second uh, example here, somebody got a toric lens in the eye. First day, good visual outcome. Then two weeks later, uh, only uncorrected 0.5. He accepted some astigmatism. Um, there's not much irregularity in the astigmatism. If you look here at the visual performance, it doesn't look too bad, actually. So you may think about uh, some, some tear problem. But if you then use the uh, dry eye report, you see that essentially the tear form is quite OK. There's not much uh, problematic, just borderline. And the, re the reason uh, is really uh, decentration and rotation of the lens. And you shouldn't wait and give some eye drops for four weeks. You just go and uh, change the 10 degrees of uh, rotation in order to satisfy these patients. So I hope I could give you in a, in a, a few minutes an overview of what the Pentacom RXL Wave is, is capable of and how uh, good the addition also of the tear film analysis with the keratograph is. It really helped me quite a bit in, in, in my clinic. I really like that tool uh, very much. And uh, with this, I conclude this. This is really a good uh, situation for us. We really appreciate these machines and use them, uh, using them every day in our clinic. Thank you very much. So it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Roy Chetty from India, who will give us uh, a lecture called Pushing the Limits with the Pentagon. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks uh, Oculus team for this, uh, for this opportunity to present our data on pushing the limits with Pentacam Wave. These are my financial interests. So what does a cataract refractory surgeon need today is something which looks at a good tomography, this perfect strong indices, which combines biomechanics with your, with your topography. And you also need a good biometer, which my previous speaker has so beautifully explained, the pupillometry and abrometry, both for the cataract and refractory surgeon. One of the challenges we had during the COVID time is if you are to do this test, you have to make a person move from one machine to the other, to the other and other. So when I started using this, this was exactly at the peak of first wave, we realized that how simple and how easy it is to have everything in one go. In a few minutes, it's done, and I have the report. And I think uh, we value about time and we value about a machine during these circumstances when one good machine can give you everything than making the patient move around. And even now, I think this saves a lot of time to the patient. So my talk today goes, when I want to push the limits of any to refractory procedures, what's new? How is the difference? I look at repeatability of any new machine. However good on paper the technology is, it all depends on repeatability. If the repeatability is not good, the technology is of no use. How different is it from other technologies in in a good way and a bad way, and what, what screening things we can do with this in the future. So what's new has been beautifully covered. It's a pyramid, and I think it keeps increasing and getting stronger. Now you have a tomographer, you have a biometer, you have an abrometer, and all in one. And everything can be done at one single time, which is different than the previous models. So how is the difference? You know, we always look at, when you see difference, we always try to compare, and comparison is always a thief for joy. It loses the love of working or looking at a new machine. So I don't want to really compare with everything. All these technologies are great. But when we started looking at comparison, because that was a time when we were working on some of these projects of what papers I want to talk about, we started looking at which one should I look at it as a bench benchmark? What machines are comparable and how much can I push? That's exactly my talk today, the pushing the limits. So if I push the limit with Cirrus, it is a very good machine, but it has some limitations of what it can do and what it can't do. Galilei, again, dual shine fluke. Wide variability, we have published this work. I trace, great, but placido-based system, Pentacam wave. And we also looked at Zywave OpScan and iDesign, but they have challenges when you look at irregular corneas. 
So when we looked at the studies which I'm going to discuss, we tried to look between iTrace and Pentacam because both were pretty good in what's doing. So what, how did it fare up? Why repeatability is important is because I mentioned this is the power of a machine for everything, to monitor progress, changes, everything depends on that. Last two papers on published on the Pentagam FCR had clearly demonstrated that is quite strong as far as repeatability is concerned with compared to all the machines. This was both the papers were clear on that part. But we wanted to study what happens when you're doing the Pentagam waves. And this has just come online, which looked at in a normal patients. Like I said, I wanted to study in all formats for all kinds of corneas. So we use high trace because of that, because it was, we already known that what machines were repeatable and what were not, and high trace was comparable. And repeatability estimates were wavefront aberrations, which is important because we have, un, we have looked at keratometry and other things which are quite good, significantly better. And this is what the paper showed. This was in healthy eyes. And this was the first part. And this was good numbers, close to 100 patients. And we had good time to do this study during COVID because we could complete the study in record time. The second paper, which is uh, in their last phase, we send the com reviewer's comment has been addressed, looking at pushing the limits again. We push the limits for any abrometer. Keratometers, yes. For keratoconus and post cross-linking. This is a challenge for an abrometer because I compared this with eye trace, Xyoptix, Xywave, and we also use the pyramidal sensing wavefront analyzers. And then we wanted to choose what should I actually measure with. Again, there I found that there's no point trying to compare with ones which could not even capture the image. So I just ignored those, like uh, the Psywave and uh, iDesign. They were great abrometers, but not pushing the limits to post cross-linking and this. So ultimately, we remained with the nitrates and this, uh, AXL. And this is extremely interesting and reassuring out here. Excellent repeatability in both keratoconus and also in uh, post cross linking. You expect it. The repeatability drops down. We need to know some values about it. And but over time, if you wait for a year, the same patient, the repeatability would increase. We all know about it and we know why it increases also. So these are very important points to be discussed out here is that even though it's a Hartman Shack based system, you can push the limits. You can push the limits what many of other Hartman Shack, which I've been used to, we used to never get it properly. So I think the system pretty works well, and this should get published hopefully any time. This is a classic example of keratoconus. You see hardly any difference in your curvatures. And the other compared, you know, you can see that it, 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 the cylinder suddenly changes. You know, you have a challenge there, especially in advanced keratoconus with a little bit of hex oak strays and some scarring there, you completely have a different picture. In post cross linking eyes, this is again, you really push the limits. You can see that very tight. The, like I mentioned, the power of a system is when you push the limits beyond its comfort zone. Comfort zone is your normal virgin eyes. Beyond limits is post cross linking keratoconus. And these two clearly demonstrates that it's repeatable, which gives a confidence to people like us who have been using it for the last 13 to 15 years, being part and parcel of our practice. Works very well with the high trace, but like this I mentioned that I did not want to use it because we were not getting good repeatable values in many of the patients. And refraction, very accurate, even in very advanced keratoconus. Something what you also see sometimes in eye trace, sometimes because of accommodative changes you don't. Trace. So this is, this is what I mentioned about these things. So to summarize on this part, they were good. But as it increases aberrations also post cross linking, this paper will be out shortly, hopefully, then you can go through this. I can share with the teams and also good. This point is very good because there was good agreement between normal KC and cross linking with, with the high trace. It's also a very good point because if they're not agreeing, that means you will not be sure whether it's matching with them or it's something else, it's giving something else. Something which I like. Your refraction, it gives you the refraction values, does match very well with the agreement with the patient, and including the keratoconic eyes, you can see the cylinders and axis 
also does. So this is very useful as far as an advanced abrometer, especially when you're trying to do a refractive, refraction glasses or contact lenses. Challenge always with the scarring, and we publish this as the haze increases, the repeatability grossly comes down. So we always have this densitometry to look for and then look at the repeatability. And that is something very important point, both in the previous and the present models. And this we have to keep in mind always when we do a study, and this is what we published. How does the tear film affect the optics of the uh, machine? Post-refractive surgery, the tear film completely changes. We use the OCAS, the Optical Quality Assessment System, to look at the tear film optics. And looking at the poor and the good tear films, we looked at the repeatability of those patients. That means we took a good number of patients from this group, a good number of patients from this group, and did both eye trace and all the other topographers and did the repeatability. That means we have a proof, not only on your T button Schirmer's test, also on the optical quality of this. And this is how the optical quality would differ because of tear film. And this is what we did, and this is what is uh, what I want to show. And I'll and this is the scatter index, and this is the scatter index which is lower, higher, more than one is significantly abnormal. Showed least repeatability, placido -based system, we know that the repeatability would change. This is also in review, and uh, let's come back for the, and you know, we have to address the reviewers, but this should also probably go through. Just mentions that even in a poor, poor tear film, which is quite common with places where the mask is still compulsory, and you see a lot of ocular surface changes. And this kind of tools, which, which helps to do a repeatability mask, completely changes the ocular surface. And I think it's a completely different domain out there uh, when we look at the ocular surface. And this is a very important point which we have published, which we are looking at publication. How is it different? For example, this uh, Professor Vinsigura and his uh, here, and I thank him for getting us all these parameters. It helps to look at, for example, you look at this kind of technologies, you know that some abnormality here. When you look at many other technologies, it just looks at the surface and you know it just gives you a normal value which allows you to give go ahead. But here it gives you a completely different picture where you have to be suddenly be a little bit more cautious about being doing these cases. And that is the combination one. And uh, this is uh, something which we have been working on when you have multiple confusion about what to do, we build an AI-based and simulation based platform, which probably will be incorporated, hopefully, in this technologies, and this is something which we have worked on. We call it the Pathfinder. AccuSemiX is the name of this. I don't want to go too deep into this, but uses finite element modeling with an AI-based system. This is how the interface looks, where you feed in your COVID data, Pentacam AXL data, and it gives you post-surgery, what would be the predicted amount of weakness? That means if this is on this side, your cornea, even if you do a PRK, that is, cornea is extremely going to be weaker. So it just gives you at one shot, there is a chance that this patient might develop an ectasia, or you can use, you can simulate LASIK, PRK, smile, smile extra, whatever you want. For example, this is the kind of things which keep increasing, and you can add that, and that will tell you what this thing is. And this gives you in newtons per meter the kind of weakness you're going to create post-surgery. And this is, and this will tell you with the flap, the thickness, and all these factors will be told. And for a case like this, you can simulate LASIK, smile, and PRK based on the data from your Excel and your Corvus. And that is something which is used by many people across. Ultimately, why do we need all these technologies? There's a story of a blind man and an elephant. Everybody touches one part of it and makes a story. But when you have a complete picture, like you excel with, with uh, biomechanics, you probably would see the elephant like a seeing patient, not a seeing person, not a blind person. To summarize, it really a hybrid system, and I really felt how important it is, especially during COVID, and this has been part and parcel of my work, Three important papers, healthy, pushing the limits with both the keratoconus and lace, keratoconus and uh, dry eye, will probably tells me that it has it has stood the test of what we plan to do. Prediction is just what I mentioned will probably be the next uh, real future. Thank uh, my team and the Oculus for this opportunity. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Shetty, for this uh, wonderful lecture. You really pushed the limits, and I think it's very good that the machine is even working very robust in extreme cases, because these are the challenging cases which are very important to, to look into. Um, we would continue now with uh, the uh, uh, pre-recorded uh, uh, lecture from Professor Ambrosio, and then we hopefully have uh, uh, one or two minutes for discussion. Can you start the presentation? Hello, I am Renato Ambrosio from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very happy and grateful for time. participating Excellent. in the OCO Symposium during the ESCRS 2021. My topic is Enhanced AI for Ectasia Screening by Integrating Corneal Tomography and Biomechanics. Of course, I have to disclosure my collaboration with Oculus, which I had the privilege and honor to participate uh, on the R&D research to improve the, the technologies for over 15 years. I also have my collaboration with the Brain Group and my master class with over 20 hours of presentations with multimodal refractive imaging. Interestingly, what about the future? I really like this advertisement and I think it resonates with the quote of, from Peter Drucker that the best way to predict the future is to be active on creating it. So when you think about the diagnostics with the Pentacam, we have corneal tomography and anterior chamber evaluation along with multimodal imaging that includes axial length and ocular wavefront analysis. We have data that can help us beyond front surface and tomography of the cornea, including angle closure glaucoma, and of course, when you think about the Bell and Ambrosio, which has a collaboration over 15 years that combines elevation and thickness profile for the deviation of the melody, and also the nice work by Michael Belling on the progression display. We have to think about ectasia as a concept of two hit hypothesis. We have the hit from the procedure in high myopia causing ectasia. And also we can have the form through scleroconus or the susceptible corneas that can evolve to progressive ectasia. These are the two possibilities in the pathophysiology for ectasia. Interestingly, considering the resistance of the cornea, the impact from the procedure and eye rubbing and any cornea may develop ectasia. I would say that if you want to avoid ectasia, tell people not to rub the eye. That is something that everyone would benefit from. But of course, if you consider the difference between aggravating keratoconus and causing ectasia, I think we have a huge step forward for the understanding of this conundrum. As we know, we have to be evolving always. And that's something that we have to consider when you think about form food keratoconus that was described by Mike Kamsler as an incomplete abortive form of the disease that may progress or not to the clinical full-blown form of the disease. We have the categories of diagnosis by Urbinovitz in which you have form food keratoconus as the abnormal topography from a patient with normal slit lamp and normal distance correct vision. The fellow eye with very asymmetric ectasia with a normal topography will be defined as form foods by Kleist. The fact is there is no consensus, and my humble contribution is that topography should not be the way to define form through keratoconus. This is not a topographic classification, but I would say that form through keratoconus is a high susceptibility for ectasia progression. And this case comes into mind, the 2008 uh, done subbomon keratomyosis, thin flap LASIK with a low residual, a good residual from a bed and a low PTA. Interestingly, this patient motivated us to look at the variability of subjective classification because some people would say that this little yellow here in the Steve Kleiss 1.5 diopter scale would be pathognomonic for form fluid keratoconus. But looking at the classification from 11 experts, the mode was zero from zero to three. And with a different scale, with a holiday scale, with a half a diopter, you can see the normative scale varying from zero to four, but still with a mode of zero. The idea is to go beyond but not over, beyond but not over detecting keratoconus, detecting mild disease, and beyond but not over the understanding of front surface topography. You have to go to tomography and even beyond to understand susceptibility for ectasia. And the susceptibility for ectasia in tomography would be able to be detected in this case. Looking in the retrospective from the U12 files from the Pentacam, we have abnormal bed D and arc max. Interestingly, when we look at a larger, larger population, 105 ectasia cases in which we had the pre-op data from the Pentacam, we were able to detect 60%, about 60% considering the cutoff value. Interestingly, we can do better with the Pentacam raw data 
we have the Pentacam Random Forest Index. Very nice work, brilliant work by Bernardo Lopez doing his PhD thesis at the University of Sao, Federal University of Sao Paulo. And we have the enhanced tomographic assessment using artificial intelligence. But we need to do better. If you see here, you have cases that are not detected by tomography and makes the point that you have to go to the biological properties, including biomechanics. Biomechanics today is evaluated with the Corvus ST. The Corvus ST gives you uh, in a 31 milliseconds, uh, seconds of 140 frames that characterize the cornea deformation during the IOP measurement with the air puff. So we have a lot of data that can be combined and uh, nice work by Ricardo in Paolo Vinciguera with the CBI, the corneal biomechanical index or the Corvus biomechanical index. You can improve the detection of ectasia considering the biomechanical properties of the cornea. And you can even characterize if the cornea is softer or stiffer considering the data that you have. It also can help you to enhance the specificity to develop, to detect ectasia in a patient that develop uh, progressive astigmatism after surface ablation. And you can see here with a different scale with the front surface topography, this patient was sent to me for cross-linking evaluation. And of course, when you look at tomography, you can see there is no abnormality here, but you have shine flug imaging after PRK, you have the, the transparency of the cornea being abnormal, uh, abnormal, and this patient has in fact haze, and the CBI post LVC was very important for us to understand that the patient does not need biomechanical reinforcement, but control of inflammation and treatment of the ocular haze. But our idea is to combine tomography and biomechanics to understand the pre-op the pre-op patients as a candidates for laser vision correction. So we have developed the random forest index that combined tomography and biomechanics, the work combining the, with Paolo and Ricardo Vinciguera and Cynthia Roberts, along with Bernardo Lopez and El Sheikh Ahmed. We have the CBI now with the TBI. The TBI has a more complex artificial intelligence with a random forest in which has 100% sensitivity and specificity for the clinical keratoconus cases. But considering the fellow eyes with normal topography here based on a strict criteria, we have a very good sensitivity, but you have cases down here. Interestingly, in my view, this is an epitome for ectasia susceptibility. So we have cases like this one in which you have 2015 distance correct vision and the TBI would be abnormal here driven by the CBI. Interestingly, this patient has a fellow eye with keratoconus. If high sensitivity will be uh, one of the factors, but also there are cases with uh, uh, one eye only heading ectasia. This is unilateral ectasia. And that's the work that we want to go in progress. This patient had a great result in the right eye with a cornea ring, a keratoring ring implantation, and everything is normal. And the patient was seen by Dan Reinstein, who is prolific in his examinations and everything was normal, including the epithelial thickness and the orbis scan analysis. The, the retrospective evaluation of the TBI was normal since the first examination and is still normal in a follow-up that was more recent that I was able to see this patient. So the wisdom is that true unilateral keratoconus does not exist, but secondary ectasia can be unilateral due to mechanical process. And interestingly, it can occur in both eyes. Here we have three daughters of a patient with a moderate to advanced keratoconus that was described by Shizuka Ko in the JCRS. And all the the uh, all eyes of the three daughters are relatively normal with this is correct vision better than 2020. And interestingly, they have abnormalities on the TBI and other factors. So this is form through skeletoconus or ectasia susceptibility. Interesting, we have to understand that we don't know everything. And sometimes we have to be keen and humble to know that we don't know enough and we eventually can do better, not in fact being wrong. But in the literature, we have many cases of ectasia that were not detected by the TBI. Even though this is the best, uh, even the, in these studies, the best parameter still, these cases lead us to the opportunity to look at uh, an optimization. And I would say that AI is a revolution in evolution. And we have the ability to, uh, in a multicentric study, looking at the larger population with 551 normal topography eyes, and these patients would be very good because the sensitivity here with the bad D, V3, will be 70.8.
using a, using a cutoff that is very low. So we were able to optimize it using random forest to leave one out. And here, looking at the sensitivity, we improved from 75.7% to 84.4%, not only improved the sensitivity, but also the specificity and the cutoff value is a little higher. So we can improve our understanding also for the clinical cases, we didn't lose any of the, of the sensitivity for that. And, uh, and you can even change the threshold and the threshold for higher susceptibility. So this is a much better parameter that I hope to have in the pentacam Corvus combination very soon. In my practice, I have many cases like this one. This 13 years old, he comes as a keratoconus patient, 26 in the left eye. Here you say topography is already abnormal. This is the atlas half a diopter absolute scale. If you see the fellow eye in Ambrosia 2 and Atlas, both very normal, they has 2015. How the technology can help you? The technology can help me first identify form through skeratoconus in the right eye. And this is to confirm based on the TBI that's subnormal. Interestingly, how can the technology help me in the fellow eye? The fellow eye has a clinical keratoconus on topography on the front surface, but you see not only because of age, but the low biomechanical property, especially the stiffness parameter described by Cynthia Roberts, this is a very high predisposition or susceptibility for progression. And if you look at the second exam, I advised the patient to do cross-linking, but they understood that the need was uh, debatable and they decided to wait. And a few months later, you see the K-max has decreased. However, there's a steepening, unquestionable steepening in this area that is very nicely seen by the bell in ABCD. You can see in the left eye, the progression, even the loss of this is correct vision and the right eye is everything stable. So this is a very important way to look at the multimodal imaging for refractive surgery in which you have to apply artificial intelligence and ancient intelligence, which is philosophy, understand the hows and the whys. The treatment for refractive surgery is customized. You can do better with multimodal imaging. And when you think about ectasia susceptibility, screening, diagnosing, staging, prognosing, doing the follow-up is very important. Of course, you can go beyond to lens characterization and this true revolution in evolution, which is multimodal refractive imaging that you can do with the integration of data, science, and wisdom. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambrosio, for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes time. So if somebody uh, would like to ask a question, uh, and is uh, Professor Ambrosio online? Is he also here? Can we hear him or not? Anyhow, any questions directly to the panel? You're still eating? You're sleeping after eating? I uh, <laughs> would like to ask a question yeah. to you. Uh, all this keratographs uh, parameters you mentioned, uh, how repeatable are they? Uh, because it's very important because, uh, you know, it's, it's a dynamic change which keeps happening with the very blink. So yeah. So we are, we are still in uh, examining this also in control studies, but we have the impression that this uh, has a high repeatability. Uh, I did also a couple of studies with the HD analyzer uh, uh, on this, and I think at the moment I have the impression that we have a, a stronger um, uh, data security with the Pentacam, with the, with the uh, cartograph, I have to say, yeah? uh, because with the HD analyzer, I have changing, changing data sometimes. Yeah, uh, I cannot really show an, an, a direct study at the moment, but we are, we are in, in progress. But I think that's very important. Yeah, it's a good question also to ask. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe I can you ask you one question. Oh, there's one, yeah. That microphone one. Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, do you have the same maneuvers to do or the investigations to do with the post lasik ectasia like the virgin eyes or it will be different in term of diagnosis and term of treatment i mean would you have like a lower threshold to treat those patients who had suspicious 
topography or uh, biomechanics to treat with the cross-linking or stabilizing treatment? For you. Um, using these technologies, uh, one of the things is, you know, it helps you to be very patient when you actually get this kind of suspicious cases. When I say having patience is that waiting. One of the best way to know if it's changing is by waiting because most of this, uh, I think the last case Dr. Uh, Renato showed was that, you know, when he waited for some time to look at what is happening, there was a progression there. So if there's a progression, you know that the cornea is actually moving towards, inching towards uh, uh, full-blown keratoconus, then you, at that point of time, you can, can take care of it. So if it's not, then uh, today, depending on the refractive error, you know, you can completely bypass the cornea and take care of the ICL, or if it's a very small power, then you can do the uh, PRK. So that, that is, is that a question you asked? Yeah, and okay. for how long you will wait? You will wait like three months, six months? If it's a younger patient, you can probably have to wait for a year or more than a year. Many of them don't even change. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Maybe I have a question for you. Uh, post uh, cross linking haze, how much can that interfere with measurements? A lot. A lot, because we would see a difference of one, one and a half diopters in the first three to four months. So, what's your strategy, uh, strategy uh, there? How, uh, how can you prevent unnecessary treatment, retreatment, I mean? If, if you look at that grayscale units, which looks at the haze densitometry, and you see that it's changing, mm -hmm. consistent changes there, then you know that it's your, your pachymetry is usually the most affected. You can actually show a pachymetry drop by 40 microns mm -hmm. because of the haze. And unnecessarily, people think that the cross-linking has failed, and they do a re-cross-linking. So don't make any judgment for at least a year. Mm -hmm. The new keratocytes repopulate by sixth or seventh month. They will usually take off those fibroblasts, and you will start seeing getting the cornea clear. And your repeatability of the machine gets better as your haze densitometry increases. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel all machines, even Petacam AXL also has the same problem, that every machine has to go through this challenge. But in this case, we have the densitometry to actually compare how the haze is and how the uh, machine is showing. So. I personally feel that uh, the densitometry should be one of your main uh, focus when you measure the repeatability post cross-linking. We have one last question, yeah. please. Yes, Professor Shetty, can you comment or do you have any study regarding the repeatability of the pentacam after intracorneal rings? And can you comment on the need for the Bellin-Ambrosio progression display for people who are using intracorneal rings for treatment? Um, I don't have a published one yet, but I know that the repeatability drops down close to a diopter. And uh, because the second challenge you have is after a year, there's a lot of epithelial remodeling. So you have to measure it, look at the epithelial, look at the repeatability based on the epithelial remodeling also. Because epithelial remodeling can be close to a diopter again. So it's, it's a challenge to just look at the machine and measure it. So you can look at close to adapter, adapter and half of change happening, and that could be variation because of the epithelial remodeling and the ocular tear film. And uh, I do not really consider the, the bad D and other parameters post, post intact because it would definitely change. So you have to more or less look at the curvature map as your main focus. Great, so thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, also to the also very sophisticated question, actually. I think we had a very nice symposium uh, here and we like uh, to thank also Oculus to make this uh, possible. And I think we both uh, wish you all a very successful and interesting uh, ESCRS here. Thank you very much. <laughs>